We're ending uh, with this final panel, and Avi's going to introduce it. But again, just a reminder of the tra trajectory of the day. We started out broad base. The good news is there's this much energy at the end of the day. I love it. I love it. All right, all right. We are landing the plane, friends. It is hard to believe. So, uh, we this last session, um, I think it's Admiral General or Admiral Stockdale um, was in a, a prisoner of war in a POW camp during the Vietnam War. But he had this phrase that's known as the Stockdale paradox. And the Stockdale paradox is never be afraid to admit the brutal realities and never lose hope that things will get better. That's right. And that's what we're trying to do today. That was our, our intent to accomplish today, to acknowledge the brutal realities of housing, affordable, attainable housing, the brutal realities of pe person's life circumstances, acknowledge that, understand that, and never give up hope that it can change and get better. And so this last session is ending on a positive. Um, again, not that the folks up here haven't had struggles or challenges or anything like that, but we want to end on this positive note. After they're done, we've got a few housekeeping things to wrap up, and we're going to see our final uh, uh, artwork at the end. We're going to hear a little bit about that, and then we should be done right on time. So with that, Avi, take it away. Amazing. Thanks, Chris. We have the fortune um, of having some amazing people on the stage right now. Uh, this session is not without hope, not without solutions. And so uh, this session will be be joined by regional and statewide housing leaders who share success stories, best practices, and funding opportunities. Uh, they will share their insights and how creative partnerships and resources have leveraged to fund accessible and affordable housing. Uh, who I have on stage today, this afternoon, and I, I don't have any alliteration for this one, this just didn't work out, but <laughs> I have Erica Sims, who is the CEO of Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, uh, Erica, Erica has worked in the nonprofit management, affordable housing development, and community organizing fields for over 18 years. Her focus has been social and economic justice through housing and economic development. I also have Mariah Williams, who is the strategic housing manager for Virginia Housing. Mariah has spent more than six years working at the intersection of business and social impact leading and managing community investment initiatives in the private and nonprofit sectors. She is skilled strategic and cultural, she's a skilled strategic and cultural connector who is passionate about activating people's spaces and ideas. Thank you for being here, Mariah. Olivia Rains is the housing program manager for Central Shenandoah Planning District Commission. Olivia is the housing program manager. She, through her role, Olivia manages all housing related grants and programs at the CSPDC, including the PDC Housing Development Grant, the Regional Housing Study, and the First Time Home Buyers Program. And we also have, and last but not least, Sunshine Mathan, who is the executive director of Piedmont Housing Alliance. Sunshine is the executive director of Piedmont. He is committed to supporting deeply equitable and sustainable affordable communities. He has led the development of over 1,200 healthy, efficient homes in Texas and Virginia. As a nationally recognized leader at the intersection of climate resilience and equitable affordable housing development, Sunshine has consulted with a wide variety of local and national housing intermediaries. Please welcome the panel. Thank you. I want to start with this open question to you all. Uh, can you describe some creative partnerships and best practices used to improve housing equity? I can start. Um, thank you, Abby, for that introduction. Um, so I know a lot of you in the room have heard me talk several times about what the PDC does. And I did try to tell them y'all have heard enough of me, but they insisted I be on this panel. Um, but for those of you who haven't heard um, about our work, um, the PDC prior to 2021 was really kind of minimally involved in, in housing work. So we've had a first time home buyers program for quite a long time. 
and have worked in housing related um, projects at the request of our localities. Um, but it really wasn't until Virginia Housing launched their PDC housing development pilot program that we became more involved in housing um, in earnest. And so the PDC housing development program um, through Virginia Housing really allowed PDCs to make regional decisions about where affordable housing funds should go. And so through that program, we launched an RFP process and provided funding to seven different affordable housing developers in our region to fund a, a really wide range of projects from permanent supportive housing to habitat projects to lie tech projects. And more than the development that's occurred, this program has really allowed us to launch strategic partnerships. So we grew our housing stakeholder list from 50 folks when we started to now our housing stakeholder list is over 280 people and a really diverse group of folks as the people in this room speak to. And so that's sort of led us into work that we probably wouldn't have done without the sort of foundation of the PDC housing development program. So I can talk about this more later, but our regional housing study, accessing SPARC funds through Virginia housing. And so it kind of really speaks to how just that sort of initial funding can spur into several different programs that we're launching now. And, and I guess I'll just add for folks that aren't familiar with the program, I think this was maybe 20, was it 2019, 2021 maybe? 2021, I want to 2021, say. 2021, Virginia Housing um, provided $40 million to the 21 PDCs across um, across the state, recognizing that these housing, co one, PDCs hadn't, you know, traditionally been, in, you know, involved in the conversation around housing holistically and recognizing I think what has come up today that it needed to be a regional conversation. So I think from that program we've seen, um, including from your PDC, we've seen so many just unique partnerships, unique ways that PDCs and partners that they are bringing in really thinking about how to deal with affordable housing challenges in their communities. And I think the, the other great thing, and I'll talk more about the resources and funding that we offer, is that it's really been a launch pad for um, organiz housing organizations to utilize other Virginia housing resources. So really thinking about how this opportunity is you know, moving housing organizations, localities across the, um, the, the resource continuum at Virginia Housing. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, Sunshine Mathon, Piedmont Housing Alliance. Uh, I'll name three sort of categories or styles of partnership. We, and fundamentally, we thrive in partnership. We do our best work. I personally feel like that's where I do my best work. Uh, so one, one form of partnership is uh, recently we've developed a partnership with a local private developer that owns a piece of land in the city of Charlottesville that had originally been planning on doing a mixed use development between market rate housing and some community based nonprofits. Um, the community asked for more affordable housing as part of that development and in our discussions with them we have ultimately decided to move forward with us to, uh, being a partner in that project with them to develop affordable housing uh, as a mix in there. So that's one form of partnership with a private developer. Another is a, um, we, have a, we manage and operate our local community land trust um, in sort of a, a sister organization to Maggie Walker Community Land Trust is the Piedmont Community Land Trust. Um, and we have a project where we're doing uh, redevelopment, or not redevelopment, refurbishment of three, uh, renovation of, th of five homes uh, in sort of a historically black and uh, lower income neighborhood in Charlottesville. And uh, we're partnering with a local church because one of the, to, to be the outreach around it because one of our priorities is that the new homeowners are gonna be people from the neighborhood. Um, and the, either from the neighborhood currently or have been recently uh, pushed out of the neighborhood because they can't afford to live there anymore. So that partnership is a, a really thriving way to ensure that there's direct accountability to the neighborhood. And then the last form of partnership is uh, for the last seven years, we've been partnering with residents at uh, Kindlewood, uh, which is formerly known as Friendship Court in, in Charlottesville. Uh, they have been true partners in designing their future neighborhood. And we have been working with that uh, a core group of residents who are elected by their neighbors from within the community to represent them through the planning and redevelopment process. And we're just about to complete phase one of that redevelopment process. And that partnership um, has blossomed into an incredible plan for redevelopment in the heart of Charlottesville that will not only be impact their lives, but fundamentally will impact the trajectory of the city overall. 
And I want to publicly apologize and ask for forgiveness. I didn't introduce Amy Garrett, so I apologize for that. Uh, she's going to be providing uh, some lived experience and wisdom around this topic. So, uh, Amy, my apologies. It's okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> Mariah, uh, just this question is for you. Uh, what programs does Virginia Housing have to reduce the cost of affordable housing uh, development? Yes, of course. Um, I feel like this is what everyone came for, the money. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, so first of all, I, I, I do want to take a moment just to talk a little bit about and not make an assumption that everyone knows what Virginia Housing, who we are, what we do. So we serve as the Commonwealth's Housing Finance Agency, and so we help um, you know, fund, finance the development of affordable housing um, with our resources, essentially a, f a financial institution uh, with a mission to help Virginians attain at quality housing. Um, but we also offer some, you know, products for consumers that I certainly want to mention. Um, I was able to kind of talk to some folks at the table before I go into the resources that we, you know, have to think about as you're thinking about planning. Um, a few of those are we, we have a first time home buyer program where we offer pretty robust um, education for folks that are, you know, learning up, trying to prepare to buy a new home. We also offer down payment assistance grants as well as closing cost grants um, uh, as well. Um, and then we offer um, funding for a rental unit accessibility modification program. That is where we provide up to $8,000 um, through agents throughout the state for individuals that need to make modifications to their home. So that's installing a ramp, that's widening a doorway. Um, and we have just rolled out this September that for that same program for home homeowners as well. Um, so that's what we offer on the consumer side. Um, in terms of working with localities, nonprofit providers, for-profit providers, um, we have a number of resources that we have to help you all as you are thinking about planning for and then developing affordable housing in the communities that you serve. Through our Community Impact Grant Program, that is one of the programs where we offer grant funding um, for planning, pre-development, and development. And there, are few, and there are a few that I'll talk about. One, through our Community Impact Grant Program, we offer uh, up to $20,000 for localities and nonprofit organizations, housing organizations, to bring in a consultant to help put together a market analysis or a plan. Um, that can be a, a, you know, a, po a planning policy, that can be a small area plan, um, that can be um, a, a market assessment, anything that is really helping you to kind of learn the lay of, your, lay of the land as you were like learning about housing issues, um, studying housing, housing challenges in the communities that you serve. Um, under our Community Impact Grant Program, we also provide funding for localities and um, nonprofit organizations to do community engagement, recognizing, I think, as um, some of the panelists will speak to, that that's a really important part as you all are kind of bringing folks along to really understand why housing is important in your community. And so, um, you know, we offer up to $50,000 for um, organizations and localities to um, bring in someone to facilitate community input sessions and public meetings. This year, we have rolled out two new categories um, that really help toward um, um, affordable housing awareness. So I think NIMBYism is something that came up in kind of most of the conversations that we've had today. And so the affordable housing awareness piece is helping you think about the education and marketing that needs to go with, you know, trying to actually develop um, you know, the units and the house, affordable housing in your community. Um, we also have neighborhood area planning. So a lot of times there are, there are rezoning efforts that need to happen. And so, you know, the community engagement that needs to happen prior to going to council or prior to going to board of supervisors, uh, supervisors we provide funding for localities and organizations to do that as well. Um, so that's on our planning side. Um, and I can talk a lot more about this. There's tons that we do, but I don't want to inundate you. And I also want to leave time for the other panelists. Stabilization and deconstruction grants. Um, stabilization grants are really meant if there are uh, blighted properties um, in your localities, in your, in your communities, offering funding for you to stabilize them by renovating them, redeveloping them. And then deconstruction um, on the other end, if there's a blighted property, um, then you know, de demolishing that to replace that with 
um, affordable housing units. Typically for something like that, we want to see um, that be a scalable project, so four or more units, not a one-for-one -one replacement. Um, and so on the other side, I do briefly want to mention our capacity building grants. And so we offer funding for nonprofits and local governments to bring in someone to develop a strategic plan or a succession plan. And you're probably thinking, why do we do that as a housing finance agency? It's not really housing per se, or it's not getting units on the ground. Well, I think we recognize the importance that in order for you all to even be in a position to develop, there needs to be a plan, um, a long-term plan and a long-term vision. And so I think this is our way of supporting you all in your efforts to bring someone in to help you think about as an organization, what does it look like over the next three to five years to prime ourselves to be ready for development. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention, and it's come up, and I feel like I'm on the hot seat for this, is we are, we do administer the low uh, income housing tax credit program. Um, and I, uh, I think I will say, for, for some of you have experience with that program, um, we have heard many times that it, it's, it's not the best tool for developing affordable housing in rural communities. I will continue to send that back to our rental, um, our, our rental division. Um, but I will say they are starting to open up input sessions for the qualified allocation plan. And I always just plug that as an opportunity for folks to kind of weigh in on what's working with that process and what's not working with that process. So I think I'll stop there. Yeah, great. Wow, amazing opportunities for uh, organizations to engage uh, and find support uh, in their efforts uh, to, to battle affordable housing. Um, Erica, I just want to ask a little bit about the Community Land Trust. Um, it's that model, and just what does it allow for the community to do that otherwise would not be possible? Sure. So uh, the, the 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 word trust is a word that you're probably familiar with when you think about. Um, estates and trust, your um, parents may put, your elderly parents may put their property or their uh, finances in a trust. You hear about a conservation trust. It's really about a legal structure to protect, um, to protect something. And so for community land trusts, which really got its start in the civil rights era in the South, this is about having collective ownership of housing and maintaining it in a trust and protecting it in perpetuity to maintain it as affordable. And so I won't go into the legal details about it, but Mag Maggie Walker Community Land Trust, like most other CLTs, has a third of its board as homeowners who own homes in the trust. It's a homeowner affordable homeownership program we operate in the Richmond region, in the three jurisdictions there. We have about 100 homes completed and about 200 in the pipeline, and they're deeply affordable. We sell them for an average of $170,000 in a market that the market rate home is $350,000. And the real shtick is that when the homeowner goes to sell that home, um, they are legally required to sell it at a discount. They are able to build wealth. The entire point is to continue to have that wealth generation aspect to home ownership. But in a market where you're purchasing a home for 160 and the home may be valued at 350 or more when you go to sell it, we don't want you to take out all of that equity from the home. Leave something in there for the next family and the next family and the next family. And so so setting that price is the key work of the land trust to figure out what can make both of these parties whole, what can see each of these subsequent families on through their journey of home ownership. And that's why it's so important to have homeowners on the board because we have those discussions periodically about how to really price those things and structure those numbers. And I see us as putting a few of those missing rungs on the ladder of home ownership back into that ladder. And so we are those first couple of ladder rungs and then we hope that you move on because we want to serve another family with that home once you are able to move on to another home. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Sunshine, you uh, have done some work um, with empowering residents and decision-making process regarding housing. Could you talk about that a little bit? 
Sure, I referenced that a little bit uh, in my opening comment, um, but Friendship Court is uh, now Kindlewood re uh, recently renamed, um, also in partnership with the residents, um, has, was, is a 45-year-old project-based Section 8 community in the heart of Charlottesville, a couple miles, uh, couple, sorry, a couple blocks south of the downtown mall. Um, and for those 45 years, it has been economically, socially uh, isolated from the rest of, the, of, of Charlottesville, frankly. Um, the average median income in Charlottesville now is a staggering $123,000. Uh, that means that half the families make below $123,000 and half the families make above. The average income at uh, Kindlewood is in the realm of $15,000. Um, and but they, that location being two blocks from the downtown mall, a short distance from the university and, and ample work, uh, work opportunities there as well. Uh, it's within walking distance of the, um, the downtown bus station uh, for what it is. It's not phenomenal public transportation, but it's still uh, better than nothing for sure. Um, it's, an, and it's an amazing location. And so when the idea of redevelopment uh, began about seven years ago, um, one of the most important first steps was taken, which was to establish uh, what has been called, become called the Friendship Court Advisory Committee or Kindlewood Advisory Committee. And that body of residents, and initially for a period of time, some also some community members who were um, sort of representative of uh, visions and perspectives from outside the community as well, but it was still majority residents, and those residents were elected by their neighbors within Friendship Court to um, represent them through this planning process. And we spent, had spent probably a total of two to three years, uh, maybe even longer, working through what could be on the site. And it's, a, it's a 12, almost a 12 acre site in the heart of Charlottesville, currently home to 150 families, has been home to uh, probably well over 1,000 families over its, over its arc. And some of those families, um, the, that community was a, a, a moment in time where they were struggling and uh, needed a, a safety net place to live for a period of time to get back on their feet, race stabilize and move on. Uh, for some families though, however, it has become um, a whole. Uh, it, it, is, it is a necessary and important critical infrastru housing infrastructure in our community, but the opportunity for economic mobility and moving out, up and out, uh, is really, really challenging. And back in 2018, prior to, uh, even prior to COVID, and it's gotten worse since then, uh, Charlottesville has the dubious distinction of being ranked in the bottom 3% nationwide for opportunities for upward economic mobility. Um, and I've had residents say to me, um, if you're born poor in Charlottesville, you die poor in Charlottesville. Uh, and so as we, as we, in partnership with the residents, Want, there are a number of factors that they really wanted to prioritize, but one of the key ones was that as we redevelop, we want to have opportunities for moving, not disrupting our community in the sense that I have to move uh, out of uh, where our schools are, where our kids go to school, where our jobs are, being able to stay in the community, but be able to move out of the Section 8 housing, one, so we can open it up for others who need it when we're, when we're ready to move up. Uh, but have sort of tiers of affordability in the community. So the redevelopment vision includes at the end, we'll, uh, uh, four phases, we'll have a roughly a third, third, third representation where a third are existing re replacement units or homes for those uh, Section 8 uh, family, Section 8 served families. About a third will be in that sort of middle affordable range, which is households in Charlottesville at this point, sort of between 30 and 55,000 a year. And then uh, a, an, an upper tier, but still in the affordable category for families making sort of like 50 to 80,000 a year. Um, and, but having those all intermixed so that there's no distinction about who lives in what unit, no one knows what your income looks like. So each phase will have an intermixing of those income tiers. And then the, the really other critical piece is that they wanted to have opportunities for economic development embedded within the redevelopment process. So in phase one, which we're just about to complete um, uh, with the residential portion, the, we're gonna be building a new 30,000 or 27,000 square foot commercial building, the ground floor of which will be uh, a new high quality early learning center that will actually provide job creation opportunities for, for um, community members on the site, families on the site, but also a place where they know that within walking distance, they know that their children are gonna be cared for. And then it's a long-term uh, disruptor of generational poverty because we know the data shows explicitly that if you don't enter, enter kindergarten, 
ready to be in kindergarten at par with your peers, uh, your likelihood of uh, one, graduating from high school, but two, just your long-term projections for uh, income generation for your family are heavily impacted. And it's almost impossible to catch up if you're not there by third grade. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I don't say it's, it is impossible, but it, is just, it, it requires <coughs> tremendous amounts of intervention and investment. So we wanna be sure that the residents coming out, uh, the families and the children coming out of Friendship Court are at the same level as the peers uh, in the surrounding neighborhood. So that, that investment in that early learning center will come in phase one. We have a financial opportunity center, which Jay Grant spoke about, uh, that we operate within the region that will be in phase two, and we'll sequence that accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Amy, your story is directly connected to some of this conversation uh, in part. Um, could you talk about how you were able to maximize services from a variety of partners in the region? And then uh, what, was the, what was crucial to your success? Um, well, I have to thank um, not only the Valley Mission, but Valley Community Service Board and even the Augusta Mobile Clinic. Um, they were there for me when I needed somebody. I was able to come to them and speak to them on a level that they didn't judge me, and that meant a lot to me. Um, because so many people will judge you nowadays based off of your past. Um, I am a recovering addict, and I'm also a felon. So um, it was kind of a double whammy with me trying to find a place to live. Um, thankfully, um, for at least the past month and a half, I've had uh, a place of my own, and it's a nice feeling. It feels very accomplishing. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. So off of that, um, I'd like to know from each of you, or whoever would like to jump in, um, just about the role of local funding in these solutions mm -hmm. and, and the local government participation as it, as it relates to these solutions. What are your thoughts? Oh, I'm going to jump in. <laughs> um, so, uh, and this gets at the solutions side of the equation here. So, um, as an organization, Piedmont Housing, over the last five or six years, we've doubled in size, both in terms of our staffing, our num the number of uh, apartments that we own and operate, uh, and we have a, um, a pipeline of additional new homes, uh, upwards of 1,000 over the next five to six years, that will again more than double our existing, pop uh, existing portfolio. Um, those homes would not fundamentally hard stop would not be possible without participation and partnership with local jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that we continue to do our work primarily focused in Charlottesville and Admiral County is because those are the two jurisdictions. One, they do have the resources compared to other jurisdictions around, not gonna, not gonna ignore that, but they have been willing to step up in a way that other surrounding jurisdictions have struggled to do. And it makes it not easy, don't get me wrong, but it makes it easier to do this really, really hard work. The development of affordable housing is uh, the most challenging financial infrastructure that you have to build uh, on a regular basis. Um, I, I look at, when I look at a, a development, and I'm an architect by, by training, I look at it from the architectural lens of, of building and engineering, but I also look at the financial architecture. It is equally complex in both directions. It doesn't have to be that way, it's just the way we designed it. <laughs> Uh, and you know we are you know, the partners with the local jurisdictions enable us to then leverage all the additional funding that we need to bring to bear. That's, that helps us leverage funding with Virginia Housing. It helps us leverage funding at the federal level. We we we, we cannot make. Let me say it differently. There is not a single jurisdiction, township, city, rural county, anywhere in the entire nation, anywhere where somebody working minimum wage can afford to live there. Mm -hmm. Nowhere. Mm -hmm. The system at this point, if you, we want to invest in affordable housing, it requires investment mm -hmm. in affordable housing. It will not yeah. happen at the market level. Yeah. We are past that. It's gone. We are in a situation now where the only way we are going to see um, change, all the change that we've been hearing about and talking about today, with investment, and the only way that investment gets leveraged is when you have, it starts with the local jurisdictions. Yeah. Yeah. 
And if, if I can add, um, I mentioned that we, you know, we're a statewide organization. Mm -hmm. And I think the most successful partnerships that we've seen, the most successful kind of projects that have come through and been able to kind of move from planning to development have been the ones where the localities and local governments have been at the table. Mm. Um, and I think on the one hand, it's the localities have identified a, a vision and have identified housing as being a part of proactively being a part of that. And on the other side, I think when we have worked with nonprofit developers or for-profit developers, Quite frankly, it makes their jobs easier if the local government is a part is a part of the conversation because they are not, you know, up against those those challenges and right. and, and and kind of those frictions. Um, and not that we necessarily like require that if a, say if an organization is coming in and seeking funding from us, but we do like to know how are you thinking about this holistically and sustainably as as you are thinking about funding. Have you been to other resource agencies um, to, you know, for match funding or um, like how are you thinking about putting together your balance sheet um, uh, to, to get a project done? Yes, yeah. yes. And that, I mean, based on the locality's involvement, I mean, that, that could change everything, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you talk about uh, an opportunity for something to be done collaboratively mm -hmm. or if you're bumping your head against the wall consistently trying yeah. to break through and, and, and develop a message that gets you through that yeah. wall. I so. mean, I think rezoning challenges alone, like I think that um, we can all speak to if, at least if, you know, in theory, if folks have been engaged in the process, then those rezoning efforts um, could potentially be a, you know, a bit easier and those challenges could be a, averted in some cases. But I mean, I, I definitely agree with Sunshine, like localities proactively. I think this is an example. Um, mo more recently in April, we sponsored the um, Southwest Virginia Housing Summit, um, which, you know, a similar effect had local government leaders, nonprofit organizations, housing service providers really talk about like, how do we address housing challenges in our region. That came from a study that um, the PDC in that area did, and it really was a launch pad for thinking about planning. We have since seen other organizations in some localities come in for either like, hey, we wanna put together a plan and do a market analysis. Mm -hmm. So I think really seeing it as a catalyst for going beyond the conversation and thinking about, okay, we know that Virginia housing, for example, is a source for us to be able to do that, so how can we leverage that? Yeah, that's great. Olivia, I see you nodding. Hey, you <laughs> Just some, some thoughts. Emphatically agreeing with all said. Yeah. But I <laughs> would like to talk a little bit about the regional housing study. Um, you all heard from Mel and Jonathan this morning, and they are um, two of our consultants for the regional housing study that the CSPDC has commissioned. So we kicked off our regional housing study in spring of last year, and um, we'll be wrapping up in spring 2024. And I've learned a ton from that process about how local governments can plug into this housing um, issue. And so for the housing study, we kind of have three subsets of recommendations. So there will be regional recommendations. So how can the PDC bring our um, tools to the table to help out with housing or bring other regional partners in? There will be partnership-based strategies, but then there will also be local strategies. So from the beginning of the housing study, we've been meeting um, with lots of different stakeholders from realtors, lenders, developers, just to hear about what housing challenges they're experiencing so that we can bring that context to the conversation when we're starting to develop these local strategies. Um, and so we've heard, as, as Mariah and Sunshine have mentioned, we've heard from developers and from nonprofits we have to have some form of subsidy at all levels to make this possible. So there are interventions at the federal level, at the regional and state level, and then there are those at the local level. Mm -hmm. So right now we're really in the strategy development phase of the study. We're meeting with all of our local governments to figure out what strategies make sense for them. And some of those are gonna be you know, financial investment and localities have to balance a lot of different competing priorities. Some of our localities in this region are very small and so they're resource limited, whether that be financially or capacity wise. But there are other ways that localities can move the housing conversation along without having to make a financial investment. So it really might be just as simple as communicating to developers that you're friendly to development mm -hmm. and making those partnerships known. It might be helping with um, education around housing issues. A lot of what Jonathan spoke to this morning, bringing that to your localities. 
or it might be just tapping into those regional and state programs that do exist, um, like rehab programs and first time home buyer programs and just being more in the know to connect your residents to what exists. So we're gonna be tackling the whole range of those in the regional housing study and um, excited to see what comes out of it in spring. Great. Erica, I'd like to ask you, um, what, what, do you what, what are the partners that need to come to the table you know, as it relates to um, you know, generating success through the Community Land Trust? Yeah, so I really liked that the topic for this panel was to leave you hopeful. And so usually I'm in the doom and gloom part <laughs> of the agenda. So it's really nice to be here and be, you guys, we could do it. Um, so I really do feel, I've worked in this field for over 20 years, and I do feel my most optimistic after long periods of pessimism. And that's because of how bad the situation has become. But because this type of event would not have existed um, in the years past in me doing this work because the prevalence um, of this issue. And I am fully expecting that um, more money is on the way. So I need two things to do my work, land and money and competency. So assuming that the competency is something that I can handle, I need the land and the money. And I really have high expectations that at the federal and state and local level, there will be more money flowing and I just will need, I will be playing catch up. And so we have grown a lot in our five years. Um, it, 100 units may not seem like a lot when you think about the scale of the problem, but in terms of the magnitude of what uh, is possible with the current resources in our industry, that is substantial and we have another uh, 200 that are funded and in the pipeline. And the things that were s recipes for our success that can be replicated by anyone in this room that I would be happy to share more details about are when we were created, um, the chair of our nonprofit, really the person who th in came up with the idea and really spurred the development of the organization was the head of the Realtor Association. And so what that says to me is that business um, bought into, the, and the private sector bought into what we were doing from day one. Um, and that allowed a lot of money to flow um, to us early on. And then with our competency, we proved that we were able to meet that challenge. Um, and then the door started opening with localities, with land, and with funding. Um, and I think one of the most exciting partnerships that we have started to experience recently, also because of that, those early partnerships with the private sector is with the for-profit building sector. So Eagle Construction, which is one of the largest builders in our region, but also works throughout the state, um, builds our homes at cost. Um, and I won't give you an introduction to them, but you can look them up in the, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the book and you can call them yourself and see if they'll do the same thing for you. That was a game changer for us because as a small nonprofit, our cost structure is so much higher than theirs. And they're not the only, and I thought this is just the most, I've never seen this kind of partnership in 20 years. This is very unique. Well, it's not unique anymore for me. Um, I now have a second developer that has agreed to do the same thing. Um, and I'm trying to work on two others. And I don't know exactly, I, I haven't sat them down to kind of soul search about why they are doing this with me. Part of it is that they have their own projects that they're trying to get rezoned, and it's good press. Um, another part is that they're tired of this problem too. They don't like what's happening in the market. They wish they could be part of the solution. and they're not able to be part of the solution on their own. Um, and so that is really the partnership that I'm most excited about and most optimistic about that, mm -hmm. that money flowing. Um, and I want our localities to be ready for this money that I believe will come. Because if your locality is behind on zoning, behind on developing local infrastructure for nonprofits and so forth, then you aren't gonna be able to capture those funds um, and they'll go to other localities. Okay. Thank you. Staying in line with hopefulness, um, Amy, I'm, I, I'd love to, to hear from you on what was the moment um, where you felt hope? 
Um, I would have to say um, when I got that phone call stating that um, I had a place to go other than being at the Valley Mission, which I love the people there. They're so awesome. Um, but it just gave me hope because, you know, being a felon, it's hard to find a place to live. Yeah. Um, people judge you right off the bat. And being able to have that hope is a very nice feeling. Yeah. It makes you almost humble to enjoy what you have, to appreciate what you have. Thank you. And so in that, in that same vein, I'd like to hear from each of you, um, the folks in this room tonight, today, why should they feel hopeful about the future as it relates to affordable housing in your, in your, in your purview? So um, I think, I mean, the fact that there are so many people in this room makes me hopeful. And I think Jonathan spoke to this this morning that surprisingly, I think housing has elevated to such an issue that it usually is not a partisan issue anymore. We might have disagreements about definitions or specifics, but I, in my conversations around the region, feel like everyone can get around this idea that we're in a housing crisis, that there are, are housing issues that need solving. And so it's really just a matter of finding that common ground. Through the regional housing study, we um, actually put together a leadership team that meets about like once a quarter to just talk about where we're at with the housing study, review the data, talk about potential strategies, and the participation and energy from all the different sectors in this region coming to bear are really, they, they make me hopeful because I do think it's gonna take unconventional partnerships that, you know, it's not just the nonprofit sector that's responsible for, for housing. All of us kind of play a role and bring different resources, connections, um, you know, expertise. And so um, I, I do think that I've talked about this with several people, but the Valley is unique in a lot of ways and that people are collaborative, people want to work together. And I think that if we can all sort of rally around this common issue of housing and move past the stage of today we're here talking, but tomorrow's gonna be really about where do we go next. If we can move to that next phase, um, I'm very hopeful for housing here. Um, I am hopeful because of Montana. Does anyone else feel hope right now about Montana? It's Montana. So, <laughs> 48th least dense country is state in the country. So, rural as it gets. Republican super majority down the ticket, governor on down. They passed the most sweep. Uh, I was thinking about them hearing the last panel and all of the the zoning, uh, you know, conversation. They passed the most sweeping zoning reform. And if you're with a locality right now, cover your ears. You do not want to hear this. They just basically gave like the wish list. Uh, it really, it's almost identical to what California did. A wish list when it comes to building affordable housing buy right anywhere you can, and if you don't get in line localities, you're gonna have uh, sticks rather than carrots when it comes to um, you know, allowing housing and building more housing in your communities. And so, you know, if you're worried about that, if that doesn't make you hopeful today, that makes you very scared, um, or you know, wanna call your lawyer for the lawsuit that you're gonna file when that happens, get out in front of it. That's what I would say is get out in front of it and be proactive so that that type of legislation um, that passed in Montana doesn't catch you flat footed. But that happened two years earlier, Montana, um, a, a Democrat in the minority had uh, proposed similar legislation and everybody said, that's not gonna pass. That's uh, you know not a good plan. Yeah. Two years later, Republicans pick it up talk about it from a totally different angle, but the exact same housing policies and pass the whole thing. So that could happen here. It's gonna happen here. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and say that um, I try to operate at the distinction between hope and optimism, mm -hmm. um, where optimism is a, an act of the mind and hope is sort of the act of, a sp of the spirit. And, um, be rooting myself in the, the, the sort of spiritual sense of hope, like we have to, people's lives are on the line. 
So even in the darkest days, that is still the way we have to, where we have to come from. We, have, we are always striving. When you see people's lives on the line, all you can do is, is, is plan and act and do your damnedest. Um, on the optimism side, um, I'm, I'm a little mixed, to be honest. Hearing the story that Erica just laid out there, that, that is, that's <laughs> optimistic. When, knowing what we've done at the state level over the last uh, four or five years, where uh, about five years ago, the state housing trust fund was seven million a year, and now we're at 75 million a year. Uh, it needs to grow tenfold, in my opinion, but still, that is still significant progress. Um, seeing the, um, there are two pieces of federal legislation that have, um, even in this incredibly divided uh, political context, have a real chance at passing that are housing focused. One is the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, which would, would bring for the first time tax credit investments into the affordable home ownership market. And then also the Housing Credit Improvement Act, which would amplify the existing uh, rental uh, low income housing tax credit program. Both of those have real chances of passing, if not this session, maybe next. Um, and those, are, those would both be transformative in terms of federal investment. But that federal investment, coupled with growing state investment, again, goes back to the opportunity for local. And I, and I think that there's not every jurisdiction, um, locality, particularly the more rural and poor counties, are going to have the wherewithal to be able to throw millions of dollars at projects. But there are mechanisms in addition to the rezoning, I'll reamplify that 100%. Um, there are mechanisms that don't cost present day money, but still positively financially impact affordable housing. For example, um, if there is municipally owned land or county owned land that can be brought to the table that is effectively free, that's one scenario. Um, another is, as uh, 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 some have mentioned here, the waiving of tap fees. That's another way. It doesn't cost money at the front end, but it does waive expenses that are important, that are that, that dramatically <laughs> impact. And then another tool that we've started using in Charlottesville and a couple of other jurisdictions have used in the state as well. It um, it's called synthetic tax increment financing, and it's a it's a the basic concept is it doesn't change your current tax base, it doesn't change your current tax infrastructure, it doesn't cost any tax money. But what it does is it ties future development and the increase in taxes that come from that future development and reinvests that future money. So it's not a loss of money, but it brings the future money to the, to the, to the now to enable uh, a subsidy and development of affordable housing or employment uh, uh, investment as well. And that's an underutilized tool in the state of Virginia, in my opinion. Um, those are a few examples. Thank you. I guess if, if I can just add, I. The question was why I continue to have hope for it. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. just, just for, this, for this room. You know, yeah, I mean, I think hopeful because I don't, I don't know that there's any, any other way to be if we want to <clears throat> see change and if we mm -hmm. want to, like, be the change. Yeah. Um, and I was really thinking about that question because I think, like, you know, I grew up in public housing in New York City. And I'm sitting here as a manager at Virginia Housing, and I know that my success has been because even though I like lived in, you know, low income housing, I was able to like live in a community that had culture, that had a sense of place where there was, at least I was able to access opportunity because there was transportation and because there were all of these other things. And so I don't know that there's any other any other way to be because even when I like I was sitting at this table and I was like there are so many characters in this room like there are just <laughs> so many like great people and I think like starting there gives you hope like recognizing even being at a housing finance agency we don't always get to necessarily work with the direct recipients of the folks receiving housing from our financing a lot of times we do not but I think remembering on the other end of the grants that we give, of the financing that we do for you know, the development of multifamily for community engagement, our people, our faces, our families, our stories. Mm. And so I think that is, that is what should give us all hope. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. We wanna open the floor for questions. We have a few minutes. Question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. This side of the room. Yeah. 
I caught flat footed. I should have known. Thank you. Um, I just want to challenge everybody in this room, especially Augusta County residents, that we have a real opportunity to change the future with the comprehensive plan work that is about to begin here. Um, we have one Board of Supervisor here, Carolyn Bragg, thank you, um, who's going to probably head that up. She's also head of the Planning Commission. There were two people here from uh, the consulting group that's going to lead that. And we need to get involved and show up and talk about how we want to revitalize our community with a different view. It's on us. We're, we've come here. We've learned a lot. Now we need to put that into action and show up at the county board and get involved in that comprehensive plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, early on, first I want to thank you for uh, bringing all these wonderful suggestions to us. Uh, I'm hoping to speak to Stanton City Council. Um, the man uh, from Sunshine said that you were able to persuade um, some group to, um, it was early on in your talk, so that they would allow some low-income units within a planned um, unit. Do you, do you remember what you were talking about? I think so. <laughs> so... <laughs> So how did you do that? I mean, what did you give them? What did you say you would, or what did they have to give up? Uh, it's an interesting question. Um, the partnership grew out of some advocacy of a local neighborhood organization, to be perfectly candid. And this neighborhood organization is, bar none, the best organized neighborhood in the city of Charlottesville. Uh, and they advocate not in a NIMBY way, not in the sense of like uh, organized to keep people out. Instead, they organize to um, preserve their existing culture and the, the folks who live there now, but to welcome investment that is responsive to the, the goals of the neighborhood itself. And so this, part of the reason that this um, opportunity arose with this private developer is because this private developer owns a lot of land in that neighborhood. And frankly, if they're going to do anything with that land, because they have to go through rezoning, they need neighborhood support. The city listens to the neighborhood. So that neighborhood activism in a positive way, in a YIMBY way, uh, yes in my backyard, um, is really powerful. Uh, and in this particular case, that means the developer had to be responsive to their uh, goals. And so out of that came an opportunity for a partnership with us. So we didn't do any convincing. It actually came from the neighborhood that was really grassroots. So in order to get um, concessions so that a developer would be willing to, I guess, give up some of his profit, do you need neighborhood um, organization or would you start with city council or what group would you start with? That grassroots level advocacy <coughs> makes it really hard for people to plug their ears, uh, for city council to plug its ears. They, when, they, when they know that there is a well-respected, well-organized body that is saying, this is what we want in our community, uh, it makes it hard for city council to ignore that. Um, the other uh, consideration is that um, the way that we are structuring it, we actually, what we have developed is a, a memor memorandum of understanding, an, an MOU. It's actually a three-party MOU between ourselves as the nonprofit, the private developer as the owner, and the neighborhood association. And we're actually looking, the city council is interested in looking at that as sort of a model for um, incentivizing development for other private developers in other parts of the city. Um, this is a, sort of an experiment we're, we're going through right now. Um, the but that MOU holds us all accountable, you know, on some level. Um, and the, that private developer, part of the, what makes it viable, we want, it, we want this to be replicable. We don't want this to be a one-time, one-shot thing. Um, in order to make that replicable, you're hitting on a certain point, which is that developer still needs to make some money. Like, it, it can't just be out of the goodness of their heart. Like, there has to be some value. Otherwise, why would they ever come back to the table? or encourage other peer developers to come to the table. 
So we are structuring it in a way where there is uh, a reasonable profit for them out of this process, um, but still meeting the neighborhood priorities. I right, have time for one more and then landing the plane. Thank you. Um, I apologize in advance. I wasn't going to get on my soapbox, but here I am. Um, <laughs> My name is Rebecca Joyce, and I previously worked at the Central Shenandoah PDC, and now I work for the city of Stanton. So I have a regional slash local perspective. So just want to give you all a quick reminder um, about government. I've, I've heard a lot of wonderful things today, but a lot of times talking about uh, government, it ends up being this one thing. Local government this, or government that, or this agency. And just to remind everybody that want to make change, uh, government, just like any other organization, is full of people. And everybody is different. Government is just not one thing. It's not just elected officials. It's also staff. It's also people uh, that volunteer. There's a lot of complexity in that. One of the things you can do to um, have local government more interacting with what your goals are for your organization with housing is start the conversations early. Start them uh, with staff. Start them when you have the idea, not when you're trying to implement something um, down the road. The other thing I just wanted to say as well is today we've been really focused on the people that need the housing, and I re really appreciate that because sometimes we get so in the weeds of the housing and needing the structures, so it's been really nice to hear us so focused today on people, and I I'm glad to be a part of that discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. All right. Back All to right. you, Avi. Yeah, thank you. Well, we just want to thank this panel, um, an amazing panel, Mariah, Sunshine, Olivia, Amy, Erica. This day has been full of wonderful information, wise people uh, on the stage and at the table, and we appreciate you. So thank you for that.